Well, hello, church family and uh, all of our friends. Um, today, I'm excited to join you and have a conversation with one of my dearest friends in the entire world. Um, I have with me today, Dr. Tony Matthews. And uh, Tony is the pastor of the uh, North Garland Baptist Fellowship in Garland, Texas. Tony, thanks for taking some time today, man, to uh, talk online. Pastor Dave, it's so good seeing you, my friend. Well, let me let me give everybody the backstory here real quick so they uh, kind of know where we come from in this. Um, and for anybody that's listening, when we go to when we go to David and Tony and referring to one another, we we both <laughs> earned it. So uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, that's, that's where that comes from. Uh, Dr. Matthews um, gave me my first job in ministry. Um, he came as the pastor at uh, what was then Victory Baptist Church, became North Garland Baptist Fellowship. Um, I was hired as his assistant in August of 1992, 28 years ago. Wow. And uh, we served a, a dynamic church there and um, just was a real formative time in my life. Both of us were in our, were in our 20s then. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, years that have gone by, a lot of water under the bridge. And uh, we have um, uh, remained great friends. And uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do, I woke up this morning and uh, on my mind last night, um, knowing the situations that uh, um, are going on in our country right now, the conversations about race um, over the issues in Minneapolis, as well as um, the uh, what took place in Central Park this week in New York City. Um, we've seen this movie before. Um, I wanted to have just a, a conversation about race and um, how, um, in particular, white Christians uh, need to listen at this particular point as to how we act and how we how we react. And so um, at, at the onset, and I'll let, I'll let Pastor Tony refer to this as well, um, this is not a conversation we've not had before and that we've had for years. And, uh, and I'm grateful for the stewardship and the, uh, um, just the opportunity we've had to talk through these things. And, and I know how they've shaped me um, as a pastor and as a person. And so uh, you, you wanna share anything about that? Uh, Dave, again, brother, it's just, man, it's so good seeing you and I'm glad you um, text me this morning and put this together. I, like you, um, just have been very troubled in particular with the situation with Mr. Floyd and his death. Um, it's just is painful and painful to see, painful to watch. And um, I'm so I'm glad to have this conversation with you. And, um, you know, like you mentioned back in the early nineties, you and I formed a, a great relationship. I did not know when um, the Lord, um, open the door for you to come to our church that we would develop such a great relationship. And I think that's a key component to having a conversation about race and some pretty tough conversations. Um, even if um, people uh, disagree on things, when you're friends and you have a relationship, um, it, it's really helpful. And so, um, yeah, this has been painful, man. It's um, just, just, you know, and then hearing the people talk about it on the radio and just, um, unfortunately, we have certain levels of insensitivity that's brought to the, to the conversation. And, um, but, you know, as you and I have um, j just said, we, we can talk about it with some level of um, um, decency and um, the relationship piece is key though. Yeah. Um, now, it took us, when, when you came in 90, 90, 90, it was early 90, 92, um, it took, we worked together for a few years. Yeah. We were doing ministry, we were in the foxhole, and, and for your pastor, for your, for your, for your, your assistant pastors and your church members and, and whoever's listening to this, Dave and I, we worked together for a couple of years, I mean, in the foxhole, God blessed our church, and it took a couple of years for us to have a serious conversation about race. Um, something happened in the city that led us to, to, to sit down and talk. And for the first time after a few years, and this was well after you and I had a great relationship that we had a serious conversation about race. And um, you, you may remember when we were, when you were in the office, you, um, we were, we were talking about um, the, the tanks yeah. um, rolling 
um, into Alabama and, 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 and the dogs, you know, being unleashed on the people, that whole context of racial um, injustice in the South. And, and when you mentioned to me that when you saw those tanks that you didn't know it was America, That's right. it blew me away. That's right. It blew me away, man. And it opened my eyes. And then from that moment in the early 90s, that helped me to um, not um, judge uh, my white brothers and my white sisters mm -hmm. because some of them just do not have the background and the context. And they don't see this through the lens that African-Americans see it through. And I, so that was, a, that was a pivotal moment for me, Dave. Pivotal, man. And, uh, you know, just, just to give that even more framework, um, you know, Amy and I came to the church at Victory um, in um, the beginning of 1991. And for those of you that don't know that are watching this, it's, a, it's an international congregation that was in suburban Dallas, or it was actually in Richardson at the time, and now they're in North Garland. And so they were breaking these barriers. And so that was attractive to me um, a young guy from Kentucky who came to Dallas to go to school. And, um, so those initial, um, uh, those initial battles for me had already been fought of dealing with any racial animus and things like that. Um, but that season in our life or that season of my life took that to a brand new level where we actually talked about things like that, where, um, I was watching a doc documentary and I saw tanks going through the streets, looked like something from Afghanistan and found out it was Birmingham and uh, said, you know, this, maybe I didn't pay enough attention in school, those types of things, <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> but it was the first time I paid attention to say, wow, something, you know, th th this was a right. And, and so, you know, it, it, it started a, a long pathway of discovery for me that, you know, I'll be 50 this year. And, and it brings me to this, even this particular point and situations like this uh, with the, the incident with uh, Mr. Floyd in, uh, in, in Minneapolis. You know, um, let, let me just give my, uh, my, my initial reactions. I was watching the video and um, I saw it two days ago um, just on a screenshot, but I actually watched the video for the first time last night. And I'm sitting there in my heart, it's just breaking in two because this man is, he is, he is asking for life because he's asking for breath. And, you know, there is, um, there's, there's no compassion whatsoever. And right there in front of us, um, that man died on a video screen. And, 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 you know, the, I heard the paramedics say they checked his pulse numerous times. And exactly. So, yeah. From that moment, even to the ambulance, he he was gone, and um, something that was something that was to be avoided. And you know, I think one of the things that we want to talk about is is you know what how how do we view that? Um, how do we view that from individuals who are white? Um, and then what's our response to that? And then you know, certainly as believers, um, what's what's the gospel message? What does it say to us? Um, at this particular point. And so uh, one of the things I talked about with, uh, with Tony offline is I said, here's, here's the difference that it makes for me. I think about Paul's words in, in Romans 12, um, weep with those that weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, that when I see that individual there, I, I don't just see person X. I, I see people like Tony Matthews. I see my friends. I see people that I love dearly, that I have a deep relationship with, whereas some individuals can compartmentalize and say, well, you know what, that's, a, that's an African-American guy in a, in a big city. And I know what, I know what some people will say. Um, they're consequentialists. He, he had it coming. He shouldn't have passed a, 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 a counterfeit bill. And, and all of those reactions are so wrong. Um, because it just dehumanizes um, the individual. Exactly. Exactly, Dave. I tell you, man, um, it's really tough to, as you mentioned, to watch that video and to see life um, just, you know, taken uh, mm -hmm. from his brother and then for him to be, you know, screaming out, I can't breathe. And the reaction of the other police officers who were there um, not intervening 
on his behalf is 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 pretty pretty rough as well. Um, I think um, white America, um, and let me just narrow it to white believers right now, yeah. or non African American believers. I think it's important to um, to come together and and. And, and, and really, I think white America is going to have to solve this problem. I think this is going to be a problem for white Christians to just say, okay, something is up here. I know that um, what I typically do when we have any type of controversy, anything that's race related or, or controversial, what I do is I, um, I, I pause, I wait, I get all the facts. I contemplate before I say anything because there's a lot of things we don't know. But this incident here, this one, yeah. um, right on the camera, for me, it makes no difference what this gentleman did. Yeah, it's exactly it makes no difference what he did. Wow. It makes if, if he resisted arrest, right. if he if he if he was guilty of what the alleged crime was, we saw him on his stomach. He was handcuffed, according to the report. And he was, and this was not like a, a split second decision that a police officer had to make. He's down there more than five, six, maybe seven, more than seven minutes. Absolutely. Unacceptable. So I think my white brothers and my white sisters um, um, should, should stand up, speak out. We need reforms. We need more training. And we need to do what you and I do, Dave, and what we have done for almost 30 years. We need to build um, cross racial yeah. um, relationships, and we need to have some honest conversations, and 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 give us permission mm -hmm. to disagree Absolutely. without 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 you know becoming enemies and angry and and man, but but I think this is going to be something that our white brothers and white sisters are going to have to, and and I, I'm 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 pleased to say that. I think this is one incident here that I, I think is going to get some traction. Right. You know, I, you know, I, I, I'm like, you know, Dave, I don't, I don't want to bring more sand to the beach, you know, right. I, you know, Absolutely. another grain of sand to the beach, the same old conversation. Yeah. I think it's time for some action. And as you know, we work together for, for years. We, we just need some, some type of action, man. Right. Yeah. Right. You, you know, uh, so many things you said there, I just so fully agree with, um, you, you know, this isn't a referendum on, um, police or anything like that, even though that's a correction that needs to be made. Um, you know what, that's, that's a long conversation. Um, this is the value of a human life that I think that people need to see. I think they need to see through the lenses of their own experience at that particular moment. Um, to those that would, um, um, you know, take the consequential approach, you, you know, just the only thing I'm going to ask you to do is if that was your son, right? If that was your son. Um, does that punishment fit the crime? And, um, and then leave it at that. And because it comes down to valuing that individual who has been made in the image of God, um, an individual that Christ shed his blood for, and that, you know, we as believers should value them. Um, Tony, let's talk about a, uh, um, just showing different framework to individuals of, of, of a conversation we had on the phone earlier. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We kind of laugh through and, 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 and this is going to be a little bit humorous and it's going to be a little bit self deprecating on my point, but I want you to see how, I want you to see how a, a white individual and an African American would deal with this in two completely different ways. All right. Um, the church in North Garland and our church here in Bowling Green at Calvary have similar settings. Of course, one's in a large metropolitan area. We're in a town of about 125,000, but our churches both sit in middle to upper class, um, upper middle class um, neighborhoods. And so um, there's really no crime rate around us or anything like that. And so you know the framework of what the churches sit in. One night I was leaving the church about 10 o'clock. I had actually come back and um, was going home. And I pulled out of the parking lot and, and I did not break at the edge of the parking lot. I just kind of rolled on out. There's not a stop sign. I didn't do anything illegal. Um, but I guess I was going a little more rapidly than I thought. And uh, I probably was speeding, but uh, 
um, going down the side road by our property and a deputy sheriff actually saw me do it from the road and uh, he threw his lights on and he came in and caught me in the middle of a uh, residential area. Um, in this particular point, we were in a field, it was dark, it was after 10 o'clock. He came up and said, sir, you were, you were going way too fast. Um, and then anyways, the conversation went to the point where he said, uh, what were you doing back at that church? And I told him, well, I'm the pastor of that church. I was just coming out. To which the individual replied, um, I highly doubt that. Now, my reaction to his, uh, to his questioning my integrity that I just lied to him was, was probably not right. Um, and so I took my license, I took my insurance card, and I handed it to him. I said, you go back and do your work, check it out on your computer before you say anything else that you shouldn't. And I probably used some different words at that particular moment. And I said that in a spirit that was not real con congenial. And um, he went back to his car, apparently he checked it out, came back, gave me my license and my registration, and, and, and I went on. And, I told Tony this, I go, at no point, at no point, even, even when I spoke very abruptly to the individual, did I fear any physical retribution whatsoever, um, never thought twice about it. As a matter of fact, I felt the need to um, put him in his place a little bit for questioning my integrity. Now, when I told Tony that, um, that, that, that instance, we kind of laughed about it. Tony, if, uh, if that happens, pulling out of North Garland, how, how are you going to react? <laughs> hey, man, listen, um, Dave, I, I'm glad you shared that with me. And, 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 I, and I sure appreciate your candor. Yeah. And let me say, let me say up front that um, the majority of my uh, encounters with police officers when I'm pulled over or anything, they have been excellent. You know, I, I have great respect for law enforcement. Absolutely. I, 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 I pray for our law enforcement, man. I, I, I know there are so many wonderful police officers out there. Yes. Now, if I were in your situation um, and I pulled out of the church and was going down and I'm, I'm, I'm stopped by a police officer, um, you know, whenever I see the police lights go on, you know, something activates in me. Although I've never had a, 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 a bad experience, with a, with a police officer um, in my adult life, obviously, I'm talking about, and not, not to imply that I did when I was a kid either. I, I didn't have run-ins with the cops or anything like that. But it's because of the climate and because I know that it can just be one bad cop that can take me out, man, I would have, um, my reaction would have been totally different. First of all, I would have never, ever, ever told the police to go do his work. <laughs> Never. Yeah, I and um, I would not I would not have felt even um, when you, you mentioned that to me, Dave, and I, I, this is such a great example. And it's so real and raw, man. And because I would have put my hands up on the on the um, steering wheel. I would have, you know, yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. Um, and it, when I if he was asked, what was I doing at the church? If I said, well, I'm the pastor there. And and his reply would have been um, like, what what did the cop say to you again? I highly doubt it. Yeah, if he would have said to me, or she would have said to me, I highly doubt it, I'd have said a, not a word. Yeah. Not a word. Mm -hmm. I'd have given up my license and and I would not have um treated or I'd have been so careful, man, because right. again, it's kind of like, you know, we had two kids that grew up with asthma. And when we went to when I went to an asthma workshop when our kids were young. The doctor said, listen, um, you never technically grow out of asthma. You can go 20 years without having an asthma attack, and, the, and then the 21st year, you can, it can kill you. Yeah. So although I may have had 50 good encounters with police officers, the 51st one, in my mind, can kill me if it goes wrong. So that's my mindset. I respect police officers. But, man, I, I would have not have felt the permission right. to um, – and, and as we talked offline – yeah. Um, that's something that's different within us. You, you had no problem right. letting the police officer know, right. you know, okay, you go, you go do your work. And, you know, basically you were, you were ticked off. I'd have been ticked off too. Right. But I wouldn't have said a word because where you in that instance was given grace and mercy for me, potentially, right. potentially, right. because we don't know for sure, but potentially, and it could have been the unpardonable sin 
Absolutely. And um and and the great white throne. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So you know it, it could have been yeah. two totally different outcomes. And, and based on my experience and what I, I know, um, I I just can't go there, police officers, because I I mean they could do. And that again, not to take away from all the wonderful, and you know personally right. that I have um, police officers who are white, who are friends, yes. wonderful friends. Yeah. But man, there's some bad apples in that bunch. Right. Bad apples in that bunch. And 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 let me just underscore what what Tony just said is that um, in in no way am I am, am I sharing that story um, to to speak uh, very ill of um, of police officers. Um, we, uh, we highly respect that. I, I want people to see though, the reaction, um, of, 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 of particularly African Americans in similar situations They would not feel the freedom to be able to do that. And, and although my actions weren't, weren't warranted, weren't justified, I probably should have just handed it out, but, uh, tired in a weak moment, um, that that's just what happened. <laughs> Yeah, and the, the the point is this is what I want what I want my white friends and my white church members to hear is regardless of regardless of the internet memes you see or the conversations that you have, there is a difference in perception um, that is there, and that we need to be we need to be willing to look at it through our brothers and sisters' eyes um, to see the realities. Um, that are there, and and I know that that's documented, and I know other people have shared those uh, those situations. But you know, the, this is two friends that are 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 uh, talking about a situation that I, that I hope would help individuals see uh, what takes place there. So, um, yeah, Dave. That's well said, man. Well said, um, brother. Tony, what what are some resources individuals can use? What you know, individuals who are uh, white believers, um, because you know I'm 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 a real big believer in data. You're a big believer in data, um, as opposed to in your analogy of taking more sand to the beach, um, is is well heard at this point because oftentimes the the echo chambers and the the polarizing figures we allow them to be the ones that speak for all the debates. Um, there's the same middle of uh, of, of people in this. And um, what are some resources that are available to folks that as they, as they understand more and are able to grasp difficult racial situations or, 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 uh, or discussions, what are some things that we can put in their hands? Yeah, um, Dave, that's a, that's a great question, man. I, I, I would encourage um, um, white America and African Americans and any, any race to get some solid resources on um, um, some books and resources on race relations. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, man, if, if you can arm yourself with race relations, get some good resources. George Yancey is a great, a great, he's a sociologist who um, used to be at UNT. He's no longer there right now, but man, he is a, a prolific writer on, on race and race relations. Mm -hmm. Anything you can get your hands on from him to read, it, it, it would be very, very, very beneficial. And, um, um, I also, from a practical standpoint, I mean, that's, you know, that, that will massage, the books will massage your mind. And from a practical standpoint, man, people, I wish people could do what you and I have done. And God just brought us together oh, um, almost 30 years yeah. ago. But build, be intentional at building some, um, some, some relationships with people who are not like you. And that's going to take some intentionality. Um, our church, when you were there, it was um, a lot more... Um, integrated, but our racial demographics have changed over the years and we're predominantly African American. But having said that, I still have white friends and, and Indian friends and I have friends who are not African American. And man, have these conversations. I think the, man, the treasure of having relationships with people who aren't like you and being able to, to communicate about race and look at it from somebody else's perspective is that's going to even do you a, a, a lot of good, probably more valuable than some of the resources that are out there because you'll have some personal experience. And let me quickly say, Dave, um, earlier you mentioned how when you see um, um, that image of the police officer's knee on, on, on um, Mr. Foy's neck, 
and how you think about your black brothers and sisters. Now, what happened with me, with you, and this has one way that I've been impacted um, is when we had that conversation in the 90s about Dave said, well, man, you know, I just didn't really know. I didn't get it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't really realize this was actually happening here until I actually went and studied it. What that did for me is it um, moved me from not, I said, listen, I got white friends. So when I hear people painting all white people right, right. as villains and all police officers as no good. And so that whole all language yeah. gets to me because I, like I said, I know I have non-African-American friends who are absolutely outraged over what they see. And, and it will take the David Giffords, I believe, um, um, of life and, and just, you know, uh, people who are not polarizing figures right. to really rise up um, and, and galvanize communities and say, hey, listen, we got to change this. We got to change this. That doesn't mean that African-Americans shouldn't be involved in the process. Right. But um, it's going to take real good, solid non-African-Americans to say, hey, enough is enough. Um, something is going on. We can't sweep it under the rug. You know what I'm saying? That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and so, you know, coming to the end of this, and certainly we could go, we can go a million directions and perhaps we'll do that again soon. Um, but um, well, one thing I failed to mention at the beginning, um, Pastor Tony did a, um, um, a D-Men at uh, Southwestern Seminary. Um, his his D-Men work um, produced a book that was entitled, There's More Than One Color in the Pew. I got that right, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, I, it's a little dated, isn't it? <laughs> I used to have a copy of that book in my library, but I loaned it to somebody and they never gave it back. And so, um, but that's good. That's, that's good news actually. <laughs> absolutely. And so, uh, um, but I, I say that to say this is that what created the platform for myself, um, along with, with a lot of other individuals was that we were in worship with um brothers and sisters of another color and you know we had we had the church in in, in garland there we we had uh, african americans we had anglos we had hispanics we had um we had asian americans and others and and you know it was a it was a beautiful melting pot and what brought us together was the worship of the lord jesus and that we were locking arms and we were doing ministry together. And in that context of being one in Christ, um, we were able to um, peel back the cultural layers that were around us and kind of peek behind the, peek behind the curtain into one another's lives when you build some trust uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. And so um, when, we, when we come to the close of this, two, two pastors, um, we want to say to anybody out there, is that ultimately the issue is um, the need for the gospel to be proclaimed and for people to respond to the good news of Christ. I'll, I'll borrow a line from Kirk Cameron. And, you know, the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart and that uh, the Bible said it is set continually on evil. And friend, make no mistake about it, what we saw was evil. And it was absolutely evil. I, I don't know the gentleman. I don't know the perpetrator. I don't know his heart. I don't know his background. Uh, but I do know symptomatically what came from it is just from from sin and how it has wrecked the human heart. And so, um, Tony, you want to address that just a minute as we as we close? Yeah, man. I, I um, again, just from a theological perspective, man. Um, we have a common ancestry, Dave, for humanity, Acts 17, 26. And we also have a vertical and horizontal mandate from God himself in the word of God in 2 Corinthians 5 for reconciliation. Yes. We, we have to, to and, and then, of course, we're reminded in 1 John that how can we say we love God whom we've never seen when we hate our brother and sister that we see every day? God said, you're a liar, you know. So the, it's time for the body of Christ. To, um, to break down these walls or not, e not keep erecting the walls that Jesus already broke down right. um, through life. And we have to put, implement some practical steps to um, really get people to Christ. If you wanna change a city, um, get, change the heart of the mayor, change the heart of the city council people, witness to them, pray for their salvation. And then even once we are Christians, we have to be able to 
um, empathize with other folks and see life from the other person's grid and their, their lens. Yeah. And so uh, why don't we close just certainly praying for, praying for the family of Mr. Floyd, um, praying for our own cities and, uh, and for others who may be viewing this that, that realize that uh, it's time to begin to make a change and to, to, view in, to view people as individuals that have been created in uh, the image of God and not uh, a monolith stereotype and um, see them for, for who they are in Christ. Well, let's, let's pray, brother. Father in heaven, we come to you and I just thank you so much for the time to spend with my friend. And uh, Lord, we pray for the work there at North Garland. We pray for our work here at Calvary for our cities and uh, Lord, for our country is hurting right now. I pray for the families of Mr. Floyd and lift him to you. I pray for the city of Minneapolis that is being torn up. And Father, we pray for the hearts of individuals to change. We know that the answer is a relationship with Christ and that uh, as we grow in faith and as we are sanctified, Lord, that you bring us to the point and you lead us by your spirit um, to uh, see that we are all one in Christ. So Lord, we pray that uh, that would become a reality uh, for so many uh, in these coming days. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you, my brother. Love you, man. Love you, Dave. Good seeing you, brother. Thanks for doing this. All right. God bless.